Hello and welcome to What We're Watching. It's Catherine and Liz and Ed and John. So right off the bat, I watched The Diplomat on Mm. Netflix. Liz, you watched it? Yeah. Okay, so I don't know if you remember, but when I watched The Night Agent, (laughs) I kind of got in trouble because it was right up Eric's alley and I watched it by myself and then he was like, oh, I have this great show. We should watch together The Night Agent. And I had to say, oh, I already watched it. So this time Eric said, hey, have you heard of this show, The Diplomat? We should watch it. I was like, okay, great. I have already finished it. But I am rewatching it with and Eric. acting like you haven't seen it. Uh, you know, because it is very strange to watch something with someone when you know that they know what's going to happen. It's kind of like not as good of an experience. So I didn't want him to know that I already knew what was going to happen. Deception in the it, marriage. I, well, I didn't actually say either way <laughs> that I, I had I, or had not watched it. Can I yeah. interject that yeah. you were mm-hmm. playing the diplomat? <laughs> well, actually, the main <laughs> character's relationship with her husband is somewhat a game of uh, oh wow that's a ambiguity weird... yeah oh that's an interesting parallel okay so back to the diplomat the diplomat is on netflix it stars carrie russell and rufus swell as a married couple i mean for the moment they're married no spoilers but it's not going great they're kind of a little bit dysfunctional but kind of have each other's back but maybe combative don't. yeah complicated and- Complicated and challenging. Let's do all three C's. So they are political operatives, I guess would be the best term. Well, he was an ex... um, Yeah, he was an ambassador. Correct. Right. And now she thinks she's on her way to, I think, Kabul or something. Mm -hmm, Yeah. You know, some kind of real meaty position where she's going to really make some changes and do some stuff. And then she gets sideswiped and gets placed in London. Very not into it and not excited about it. Well, because there was an incident and we didn't have an American... American diplomat present to help navigate that situation. Right. They think she is smart as a tack and the right person to put in there. She is really smart as a tack or sharp as a tack. <laughs> oh, yeah. No. Liz Son is, Liz of is a bled bit. it over into your brain. Now you're God doing it. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So she's a smarty pants. How about that? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so she's a smarty pants and they think she'll be great in this position, but she's not that excited about it. This is not what she had in mind. So we're just starting with her in this new position and she's trying to navigate it. Navigate it begrudgingly. Begrudgingly. Be- yeah. Because she did initially think they were going to offer it to her husband who is a real shit stirrer. Oh God, he's great. It's and really, it, yeah, it's, it's not I mean, good. I would say nothing in the room with him there without full awareness that he is going to use that information. So why she's ever surprised in a couple of the episodes that he does that is like, girl, come on. Yeah. His true colors are he's he still wants to be in the game. And basically he should be retired and play the role of a wife, which, of course, he's not capable of. And I mean, wife in quotes, because they call him that a lot throughout this episode sort of refer to him as like, oh, you're the arm candy. You're the wife. You should be worrying about the menu or the table settings. And he's like, um, no. So it's a bit of a mismatch where he's found himself currently. So on the rewatch, I've rewatched, (laughs) I rewatched the first episode again with Eric. And I did, I think did a pretty good job of not tipping my hand that I knew what was going to happen because it's not as enjoyable for him to watch if he knows that I know, you know? So I tried to not lie outright, but not let on that I knew what was going to happen. So he doesn't know that I've watched the whole series. So we'll see how long I can keep up that ruse. But it's just, you know, I was into it and I don't want to wait. And, you know, Mm -hmm. if you're watching with somebody, you end up having to really wait watch. It's you got (laughs) to it's not good. I don't the wrong kind of weight watching. Yeah, I don't want that kind of weight watching. So I really thought it was so good. I well, it's been picked up for a second season pretty much immediately. It's already. Oh, good. Yeah, so I thought it was very well done. I mean, there are moments I could not get over Carrie Russell's whole vibe. 
the idea like that you need to be like frazzled looking. I mean, you can just be frazzled and not look frazzled. And the idea of like the hair just being crazy and the no I makeup. Did, yeah, I was going to uh, say. I mean, there, there were moments like you in the UK, very stylish. You're going to be living in the ambassador's UK residence. And they tried to kind of turn it up for her. And once again, the word you can use for her is like sort of begrudgingly. She goes along with it, but not wholeheartedly. And there are just moments you're like, you are a beautiful woman. Come on. I think they were trying to... It's almost counterintuitive the way she's presenting herself. Well, right. It's supposed to be part of her personality that she's much more concerned about the work than her presentation. So really, she did have disheveled hair, which I thought was actually very on point for like, this is a woman who is... Uh, are you kidding me? I need a conditioner like nothing ever seen before. <laughs> <laughs> it's a classic. No, friend, it's a classic friends no. move. She's got the no. po- she's got the curly <laughs> hair during the wedding. Unlike, I will say, the night agent, which I will not get into, but because I'm, I'm, I watched it with my son, and we stopped it about a thousand times because the leaps and plots sometimes were so. Like, what the hell just happened? But the one that we both stopped and looked at each other was another woman in power. And, hey, I love the diversity casting. I think it's great. I don't want to spoil anything, but I'm just going to say there is a woman president in the night agent. Sorry, right. night mm-hmm. agent. And the first time we really see her, she is in an all white suit and she just looks like a cult leader. Like it is so <laughs> bizarre. They must be her like two, like two not Hillary or whatever they think a woman president should look like. And you're like an all white suit. I just like, unless you're like a Christian, like preacher or like a cult leader, like I just, who, what woman is wearing that? Unless it's an all white party. So I do feel like can we meet somewhere in the middle and Carrie Russell's sort of put a comb through her hair? She's too busy. Oh, God. She's just thinking about she so many things. breakfast. That's true. That whole <laughs> breakfast bit in there, too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Overall, though, I still thought it was super good. You didn't. Oh, no, I enjoyed okay. it. I, you know, I like I said, I, you know, I found it entertaining. It, it's very sharp and quick and it has an element to it that I so appreciate. And I'll compare it once again to the night agent. It had no annoying teenager in it. You're right. I, That's you know, true. I, because literally, the night agent, a couple episodes in, dun, 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 here comes an annoying teenager. And I'm like, wait, that is the same annoying teenager that really Fs up things from Yellow Jackets. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. No, we I've talked about it. Absolutely. So I, I actually, mean, she's really good at being an annoying oh, teenager. Yeah, good and for her. Fing things up. So I truly appreciate this as sort of an adult intellectual listen somebody at netflix is like i love espionage i love government i mean whoever is green lighting these projects like, i mean that's the thing who Here, are yeah. you we will write one we'll have it on your desk on monday because obviously you are green lighting the shit out of this like genre <laughs> so i appreciated it and i really love that no annoying teenager regardless of gender ever showed up loved it agree Eric did point out after his one episode, not knowing that I have watched all of them, he said that he thought it had a homeland quality. Yes. And I was like, okay, oh, yeah. yeah okay. okay. Yeah. She, the Carrie character mm-hmm. in Homeland is a little bit close to this. Wait, is that her name? In Carrie Russell. Homeland? No, no, not Carrie Russell in this, the actor. John Carrie Mathis. Carrie Mathis, yes, the character in Homeland. Boy, that was confusing. Oh, it's too okay. many Carries. <laughs> uh, but I actually had Don't said. Don't get carried away. Just because of the relationship of the husband and wife in this, did you get any kind of a Hillary and Bill Clinton oh, vibe? I, I mean, I absolutely did. I think that was, I mean, I think the writer was inspired by... They did some things on purpose that felt like differentiating. They're like, no, right. the problems they have are not the same kind of problems that Bill and Hillary have. But you could imagine that that dynamic could have existed between the two of them, because obviously Bill Clinton being a president for mm-hmm. two terms, and then you have Hillary, who ran for president, one time did not even make the nomination, and then the second time nomination and was failed. Secretary of but State. But it was Secretary yeah. of State. Mm-hmm. So she's both, they've been political operators, or operatives, for almost all their adult lives. So this is parallel to it because it's like, how would you turn that off if you were quote unquote retired, but you're still completely in the world of it? Yeah. So I thought their chemistry was great. He looked fantastic. There was back nudity, which I appreciated. (laughs) 
butt I nudity. About yeah. That. Yeah, there was a, some mean, sexy time. But, mm-hmm. Oh my God, Ed, you would totally understand why I completely freaked out. He jumped into a mucky pond, and I was like, <laughs> you know, I cannot stand. I mean, what's on the bottom? Like our just muck. Oh, our horrible you know. experience in Lake Gregory when I yeah. crawled onto your head to get <laughs> out of the muck of the pond. So, um, I thought it was beautifully shot, made me want to go to London tomorrow. Yeah, I thought this cast was amazing. Because you know, I've, I've said, some of these shows feel like they turn and burn them out. There's just something a little like, I don't know, something was missing a little bit. or This had gravitas. This yeah. felt mm-hmm. like, oh, you know, when was this written? Because it felt like some depth. It reminded me of like almost old West Wing because the way they spoke was like, someone really did the research. Yeah. I mean, the writer created this world that was very believable, high, high stakes. I recommend it for sure. Yeah. And I I recommend a comb for Carrie Russell for season two. (laughs) It was uh, written and created by Deborah Kahn. Yeah. So, Mm -hmm. yeah, good for her. She's freaking amazing. Okay, so that's it for now on The Diplomat. I'll have to check in after I rewatch it for the second time, secretly. <laughs> oh, I, you know what I did want to say? Because we talked about, it was so well written, the cast was exceptional. Just a little shout out, because we only really talked about the main two characters. I love Stuart, her sort of guide to the world. His name is Eito Ascendo. He's fantastic. I mean, there was some really hot guys in this like chemistry you could feel too so i I mean (laughs) i don't want to spoil anything more but overall very well cast very well performed michael mckean one of my favorites as As well as the president yes yes yes. roy kenner as the prime minister he is difficult he is tough to deal with yeah Yeah, for sure all right Mm -hmm. so diplomat highly recommend diplomat highly recommend okay next up for me was unstable the rob lowe comedy on netflix I really enjoyed it. I have one episode left. There's eight episodes. He created it and is in it with his son, John Owen. Who produced it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I saw an interview with them talking about it. Yeah, super cute. I love it. In their interviews, they have said they they channeled a little bit of what it's like to be the son of a very famous person. In this case, Rob Lowe's character, his name is Ellis Dragon, and he runs a big biotech company. And he's like an innovator and kind of a bit off the crazy train a little bit. And his son gets sucked back into his orbit. He'd been kind of off doing his own Mm. thing and trying to distance himself a little bit. And now he's back at the company with his dad. The character that Rob Lowe is playing, very reminiscent of his Parks and Rec character, extremely optimistic and high energy. And it's (laughs) very fun. I mean, I am enjoying it a lot. I'm sorry to see it go after eight episodes. It felt very very fast. Do you mean go as in it's not renewed or we just no, don't No, no, know? I just mean okay, sorry to okay. be done with it. You know what I mean? Yeah, eight like, episodes. If it's a quick. show is good and in today's bingeable appetite, it can be done too quickly. Oh, yeah, for sure. This was like, unfortunately, over in two days. And I was like, uh oh, I'm going through this way too fast. But the cast is very fun. So you've got Rob Lowe, and then you've got his son, played by his son. John Owen. John Owen. And then two actresses who work in the lab, who are very fun, Rachel Marsh and Emma Friera. And then the main executive at this company, people will recognize her for sure, Sienna Clifford. She was the sister in Fleabag. She was oh, yeah, really yeah. good in that. Mm-hmm. And then in this, she's similar, kind of prickly and very fun. And then a couple more people in the office. There's a character named Malcolm, played by Aaron Branch. He's delightful. <laughs> He's very funny. He's extremely, extremely impressed and you know maybe in not in love with but extremely idolizes Rob Lowe's character and it's a very fun little bit and then Fred Armisen is also in this as a real oh, wackadoodle wow. so it's really fun I am enjoying it a lot so I recommend that as well I saw an interview with the two of them and their chemistry is very good and you could see how that would translate to the show. And it's like they'll say they seem to be enjoying themselves. So it's going to produce a fun product, basically. Yeah. And it's a good little story. I mean, it's a cute setup and their chemistry is good. And the surrounding characters are very fun. All right. So last for me is Somebody Somewhere, which just came back for season two on HBO. 
I love this show. It's Bridget Everett, who is a comedian and also apparently a cabaret singer. That is where I first learned of her because on social media, in the Bravo Andy Cohen world, he loves her. Oh, I didn't know that. And she was a New York-based cabaret performer. She's very well endowed up top. There's some real good boob comedy in this well, show. They so, were yeah. a character unto themselves in a cabaret show. <laughs> and she wears these dresses that look like they're barely hanging on to her. <laughs> And she's got a very, bo- <laughs> she'll whisper, sing, and then really belt it out. So it's, so I learned about her by seeing clips on social media, kind of like how I discovered Lizzo for the very first time. I went, who is that playing that flute? What? So it was like, who yeah, is remember. that mm-hmm. throwing her boobs in someone's face in a cabaret club? <laughs> so uh, she has been very well known and beloved in New York for a long time. And it's long overdue in New York's opinion that she's starting to get the notoriety and the recognition through TV shows and some film appearances that she's because Amy Schumer was really the one that was like, I'm gonna start putting you in a bunch of things. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that okay. sort of helped break her out. They have a very interesting dynamic and Bridget's awesome. Yeah, I love her. I just knew of her as a comedic actress. So I was aware of her on that level. There is singing in this show. They've kind of incorporated it. It's not a huge part of it, but there is some singing, which is how I then became aware like, oh, is she a singer? Is that part of what's going on with her? And obviously, yes, the answer is yes. So season two, she's really impressive. It's a comedy. But there's a lot of not happy stuff that is happening, but sort of a funny person dealing with Mm -hmm. tragedy and tragic things happening. I mean, the acting chops really, really good. She's doing a good job. Mm -hmm. Her best friend in her small hometown situation is played by Jeff Hiller. And he is so fun. They had a scene that literally I was like, you know, when you laugh so hard, you get cramps in your stomach. Oh, wow. I mean, it was really, really funny. John was giving me a hard time because it's only at this point been back for a couple episodes. Mm-hmm. So he's like, you can't talk about it. I'm like, yes, I can. I can because, talk about yeah, it. Because it's season two, John. Well, it's also just one of your favorite shows. So I do like it a lot. The idea that you would pause in any way now that you could talk about it again. <laughs> it's gotten great reviews from its first season. So I'm not surprised if you haven't watched it. There's a lot of buzz around it. Yeah, good. Well-deserved buzz. So the other characters that have returned for season two, we've got Murray Hill. Oh, wow. Who is very fun. Also a New York icon in the performance world. But sadly, their house like burnt down last year. Oh, I didn't know that. Their burnt down last year. And I know that from Andy Cohen or Bridget Spostein. I mean, it's a very small world. Oh, okay. (laughs) It's like, oh, why do I know this? But yeah, a New York comedian and a drag king performer. Yes. So this season two, I wasn't sure what was going on because the dad character was off on a fishing trip. And then I looked it up online and apparently Mike Haggerty who played the dad has passed away which I didn't realize so they are in the process of writing him out of the show which is very sad I love him yeah he was really sweet in the first season and I'm not sure how they're going to deal with it because they're already dealing with some kind of heavy topics with the mom character so maybe they were like oh geez we don't want to have to double down on that right out of the gate so right now he I mean can I just say in um um, one of the best Goldie Hawn movies ever, Overboard. Oh, he played. <laughs> Those are mine. Those yeah, are mine. He played Uncle Billy, which was, you know, the best friend to the character Dean, but played by my beloved Kurt Russell. I just rewatched it like a month ago, and he was just such a. <laughs> His his character is the one that takes the blame for the panties. That oh, she yeah, finds oh, the, yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Those are mine. I wear them. Oh, oh yeah, those God, are mine. Oh, that's those so are my funny. initials. But you know, now looking at <laughs> pictures of him recently, I don't think I realized how old he gotten. So yeah. you, just, you can get away from. You're like, oh, okay, he was, yeah, sort of up there. But you know, it seemed a little too young and sudden. That's sad. Yeah. So another character that I want to give a shout out to is the actress who plays her sister, Mary Catherine Garrison. 
Oh, my goodness. What a hilarious prickly sister situation, Mm -hmm. which is very fun just because, you know, having multiple sisters and you go through times when you're like not getting along, but you love each other and you're, you know, it's very relatable in that way. Although she's a real challenge. It's very (laughs) funny. And she's going through some shit and it's she's doing a great job. The actress and the character is very fun. And then we got Tim Badgley in this second season. So we'll see how much we get of him. I'm uh, God, it's almost like a cheat when you realize yeah, his character John, come on, in Grace and Frankie. Oh, you loved him in Grace and Frankie. As the the local theater director who took it very seriously. It was so fantastic. He was a prima donna. It was great. Oh, I love him. Oh, I love him. So he's popped up and I was going to say it's a little bit of a cheat, but sometimes I will look on IMDb and see how many episodes somebody's in just to like know. It's a real cheat if you want to know if someone's going to die. Like in a show, you like check and see like, oh, they're only in three episodes. They're going to die. But in a comedy thing, if I have never only, yeah. done that. That's crazy. <gasps> what? I do it all the time. It's an absolute cheat and you shouldn't do it ever. <laughs> uh, and also, <laughs> you can barely trust IMDb, so don't do it. I mean, I guess that's true. Uh, yeah, Tim Bagley, what I really remember, this is 40. As the gynecologist <gasps> is pretty Oh magical. my yeah. God. Yes, yeah, so like, I can tell you how old you are by how many rings <laughs> as your legs are spread. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's one of those people like you just cast him in that bit part and he will steal the scene. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, he already did. So, OK. So anyway, that is somebody somewhere on HBO. Happy it's back. Bridget Everett. Love her. And there you go. OK, Ed, what you got? Well, um, the last time I was here, I told you that we had finished Mandalorian, which then unlocked all these other series for me to start watching so uh, oh right you were holding off until you finished that to do some other I had ones. like you know kind of that storyline going and then you know we got back into season three and turns out that's not how you're supposed to watch them you're supposed to have watched <laughs> the book of boba fett and the obi-wan kenobi series because there is some information in those that was relevant oh. in season three of mandalorian Oops, well, that was really cool to have all the information (laughs) going into those because those are a lot of fun. And even though it's not like new, um, they're still, you know, Star Wars and relevant and all available to watch on Disney Plus. So the upshot of that was not really knowing what stories they were going to tell and knowing that these were characters I already knew, Boba Fett and Obi-Wan. I was like, I could just put those on hold until another season of Mandalorian comes out. Well, yeah, these aren't the stories that you know of those guys. It's like way further down the road in Boba Fett's line and right in the kind of middle of Obi-Wan's. Those are fine, but it was like there's two episodes where they introduced Ahsoka and had this whole interaction and switched out the Mandalorian ship. Well... Yeah, I didn't know that going into season three. <laughs> so I did enjoy watching those, and they do, you know, fill in a whole bunch of that uh, space in, in that universe. And, and there's a really irritating, like, 10-year-old kid. So, you know, that was fun. The oh. princess. She's doing a pretty good job giving, like, 10-year-old Princess Leia vibes. Better oh. than uh, possibly, you know, young Anakin. Oh, okay. I don't know. I just remember Ethan being extremely irritated by her. Yeah. But that might just be a teenage boy. Yes. You know, just being like, oh, girl. Like, I don't know. Because it, <laughs> it was like a year or two ago that he watched it. But I, yeah. I thought for a child basically being dropped into that world, she did a great job. Oh, yeah. There was a fair amount of impressive character re-performances or getting back into the zone of. And I think one of the fun parts was actually getting Hayden Christensen back for Vader. So there was like all all these fights that you never got in the movies. And you're like, well, no wonder why they didn't have to have this big battle. We thought that was the first time they'd gotten back together. Sorry, two years later, spoilers if you haven't watched it. That was redemption for him in some ways with the fans. Because I watched, I remember watching a couple fan cons or, Mm -hmm. you know, for, and they were so excited he was coming back yeah and i think for him because he really carried such a huge weight with that character and people had such opinions about it Mm -hmm. for him to be welcomed back in an excited way was a really nice sort of full circle moment for him so it balanced out the annoying child no just kidding well it's also (laughs) pretty telling when you watch the obi-wan kenobi series they do enough flashbacks to try to help you fill in the story. Right. And it's not that far along. I mean, the whole freaking Star Wars saga is like 60 years. It is not that long. So when they drop this series in, it hasn't been that long. But 
It has been a while since episodes one, two, and three. So when they play those clips, you're like, oh, right. He is older. That isn't just a beard <laughs> on a young older. dude. There's some wrinkles. I mean, you know, he does have the higher ground, but <laughs> he is showing some of his age. So, yeah. So it was very enjoyable to watch both of those and you know some of the storylines and characters that are going to come off of that and that there's another series coming up, Ahsoka that's going to be directed by the guy that kind of like put a lot of that into the universe from the cartoons. That is one thing I haven't cracked open yet is there's a couple of like the cartoon series that came out in the last two or three years that I'll watch and I'll report back to you like the Bad Batch. All right. So that wasn't really a deep dive. That was just a everyone keep watching Star Wars stuff. I am too. (laughs) Even old stuff, it's still worth watching. There's sword fights. There's a lot. There's lots of like, oh, is that why everyone's very tan there? Because there's like, you know, three sons. Man, Boba Fett was just like sunburned for like solid three episodes straight. It was rough. (laughs) Okay. But the real thing that I wanted to bring to the podcast was the movie Quasi. And I'll tell you, I tried to make a John move and I didn't really try to discover anything about this before I went into it. It's by the Broken Lizards comedy troupe, the same guys that brought Super Troopers. It's available on Hulu. Hulu. And outside of the fact that there wasn't like a boob, I think all the other Broken Lizard movies, there's at least a boob, (laughs) if not entire (laughs) sequences about the boobs that are happening. There wasn't like, you know, it didn't hit a high adult level. There was way too many adult jokes in it. But I think that was maybe like a Hulu, like, yeah, we're not giving you the, uh, you know, M17 rating or anything like that. Oh, okay. Rain them in a bit. Yes. Uh, But still very fun to watch. And given the fact that it wasn't like a real plot that they were giving you, they weren't doing like, you got to buy into this whole like, oh, you guys are all kind of crummy cops. You're super troopers. Uh, Okay. There's a plot that you have to buy in most of their movies. They didn't need you to figure that out at all. It's the Quasimodo story in case you didn't. uh, Yeah, I did not understand (laughs) that from the title. And then I'm like, oh, it's a time period piece. Cool. And then I didn't watch any of the trailers because that would have immediately given away. One of the characters is hunched over with a big lump on his back and a messed up face. A hunchback. Okay. (laughs) Oh, Quasimodo. Apparently, the Super Troopers comedy troupe, every time they've had a success, every studio has asked them, so what else do you want to do? And they've brought out Quasi, which they (laughs) they wrote in college. (laughs) Are you serious? I watched an interview. They're like, yeah, no, we've been trying to make this for like 25 years. We're so excited that we finally got to make it. Oh, my God, that's hilarious. This is their dream project. Now that I understand, it's a period piece set in like, you know, ancient times and castles with knights and sword fights. And there's way too much money that you would have to throw for these (laughs) this comedy troupe. Guys, you don't trust them. So they hit like a TV quality level of a movie. It didn't, you know, they had some exteriors that were castles. I don't think that's what they were shooting. Oh my god. <laughs> it was not Game of Thrones level HBO. <laughs> and sadly, it wasn't probably even as good as, and I'm sorry to say this to you guys, it wasn't as high a caliber as Monty Python's epics, Mm. Life of Brian, because they were actually filming at castles in England. Right. And there was nowhere else to go. That's what they did. So these guys clearly had a nice set that they could, you know, work with. And it worked fine, given that you immediately threw out needing to buy into anything. You're like, oh, it's a full-on comedy. It's a Quasimodo story. Okay, so what are we doing with this? Uh Uh-huh. That's a good cameo. That's a good cameo. That's a good cameo. Oh, right. I forgot. She's in this. All right. So just a couple names I'm going to throw out there. The comedy troupe is made up of Kevin Heffernan, Jay Chandrasekhar, Steve Lemmy, Eric Stolhance, and Paul Soder. So that's the main guys that make up the Broken Lizards group. They're all in Super Troopers. And one of the main things that like kind of put Super Troopers on the map for everybody is they got Brian Cox in it. If you remember Brian Cox, he was used to be in succession (laughs) burn sorry bro he did have a voiceover cameo in this which was very nice for the fans of those you know movies and stuff like that to get him back Uh, my husband loves uh, Kevin Heffernan and he directed this film as well yeah he loves him from Super Trooper but I'm going to tell him about this it's not even on his radar and I think my son and him would love to watch it it seems right up their alley (laughs) yes yes it is very much uh, sophomore-ish humor and uh, I was trying to figure out like why do I feel like I recognize more people in this movie. Oh, that's why. I'm so dumb. 
they all played multiple characters. So I kept oh. having to like reset my brain for which of the five of them were like there was the one where he was playing the king, then he was the bartender, then he was the guy in the crowd. Hmm. Okay, right. Then th- this time that actor is yeah, so it was a little bit complicated to follow all of that. But then also you got even more of all of the characters and actors that you loved. That's a great way to save money too, just and play multiple extra. parts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I made the credits six times. I get paid six times. Overall, the story isn't important. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of sight gags and humor and the you know the best friend story arc. We, yeah, it's fine. Don't worry about that. That's not important. That'll get you through a movie. But the jokes, that's what's important with these guys. And the all-important, one of my favorite features of a good comedy movie the during credits blooper reel oh mm -hmm. which you know that's a classic from the 70s and 80s i miss that i do enjoy a good blooper reel during the credits so there's a couple good guffaws in the credits and uh, that's what i brought this week nice all right john you're up what's up sure uh well i got one at home and one in the theater so i did watch at home on apple tv plus ghosted i am very interested in it how was it you're not interested i am i want to see it Uh, Well, to be honest, because, yes, you're irritated because Eric and I watched it without you. (laughs) Um, That goes to you. Yeah, And he did not lie to you and say that he hasn't seen it. He hasn't pretended and said, oh, I'll watch it with you. I haven't seen it. (laughs) Yeah, we're not talking about how you're calling me out secretly uh, on that tip. But anyway, um, so this is, it was funny. Eric had a real struggle with the, well, not a struggle, but through the first like 10 minutes or whatever, he's like, I don't think this is a spy movie. And I was like, "Ah, look, supposedly it is. Just wait for it. There's a little bit of romance to confuse you. It's very much a rom-com for the first, whatever, little bit. And you know, that angle does provide comedy throughout and I think is, should be appreciated. How did he not know that? I mean, I guess he never saw the trailer because it's pretty obvious that it's like, oh yeah, it's going to be a rom-com until she leaves and then he tracks her down then it turns into a spy movie this is the plot of your life if you just showed back up tonight at home and told Eric that you were a spy he is your Chris Evans (laughs) he's bought every lie that you've told him up until this point and he'll be like oh my gosh I got ghosted by this my wife totally got me I can't believe it no that would be true lies but (laughs) we're not talking about that right now so yeah neither of us had seen the promo so even though you know I knew somehow that it was gonna get to spy stuff the first bit is so far from it you're like yeah are you I sure? I don't know how <laughs> we're getting there. But Anita Armas and Chris Evans, I mean, yeah, you're like, oh, yeah, these two should never get together. It's like, yeah. These two really super attractive people. Yeah, you're like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry that you're having real struggles in your relationships. But yeah, this relationship should be fine. <laughs> so, yes, then when it finally does get started, you're like, oh, OK, now we're going. And I mean, having Chris Evans be the like not even sidekick but like you know true foil of like almost like damsel in distress yes and in the way and causing problems uh (laughs) is pretty enjoyable and i mean the first eventually he not develops skills but like okay there's some things you can do as a not small man who wrestled in high school as his father (laughs) tate donovan likes to tell us Uh, wait his father is played by tate donovan one of the heartthrobs faja yes Faja? Why is he Faja? I don't know, but his mother is Amy Sedaris. So Catherine, <gasps> oh my God, I'm sorry I love about that. her. What? what? How dare you, John? These people are not old enough to be his parents. I protest. Uh, well, yeah, I don't think. Yeah, they're like was... a 15 year difference. These are very not quite old enough. But, all right, we'll move on. These sorry. are oh, Hollywood on. ages. Chris Evans is probably not playing his real age. That's anyway, that's true. Uh, yeah, we talked about college a lot. Anyway, um, <laughs> so Adrian Brody has a good role in this. Oh, okay. Uh, and then the amount of like cameos were so fun. I am looking at the cast. Anthony Holy Mackie, moly. John Cho, Shamasin Stan, Ryan Reynolds, Tim Blake Nelson, Burn Gorman. I mean, it's pretty incredible. I mean, this wasn't quite spy the melissa mccarthy fun but this was getting there this was very fun oh my god i'm so in how have i not watched it yet i don't know watch it you know. i think it's because eric already watched it so Catherine. Would all right you i'll just be... watch it i'll just watch it by myself i mean and then has what is it... dexter fletcher doing it i like him as an actor well he directed it 
Oh. As he's directed many things, which is crazy. Oh, I like him. But is he in it or just... Yes, he has a small <gasps> part. Duality. I love it. Yeah, which he sometimes does. Uh, but yeah, I don't, to be honest... I don't even know where he came up in this. I'm not sure. Okay. I'll have to eagle eye it when I watch it. And the guys who wrote it, or, you know, part of the writing team, Rhett Reese and Paul Wernick, they have done some funny stuff with Zombieland and Deadpool, and they've also dipped into the streaming world with, like, Six Underground and stuff like that. So, and Spiderhead. Um, Ooh, Spiderhead. I loved Spiderhead. Yeah, well, uh, this one is here for you, Catherine. And yes, it's been almost 72 hours, so I'm sorry you haven't watched it since Eric and I have watched it. So very fun. It's weirdly not the best spy movie you've ever seen, but I mean, that's there was no reason to even say that. It was very fun. It's good. Anyone should watch it. Yeah, it's like a genre mashup, a rom-com spy movie. I yeah, love that. Yeah, but even that is, uh, well, he, you know, it's funny. I wanted to say no, but that is true because if you're saying it's a spy movie, it's like, well, then it should be like a serious action movie. And it's not a serious action movie. So it's like, <laughs> well, yes, that, that is the two genres. All right, cool. And I do want to say technically Amy Sedaris and Tate Donovan could be Chris Evans' parents. Why? How old are they? Uh, he's 41. I'm not right. This is all online. She's 60. Chris Evans is 41. Yeah. And she's okay. 62. So, okay. Right. 20. Yeah, but the dad, okay. he's so nice. 59. He, yeah. And then if you do the math on that, that had been, he was 18 and she was 21 when they had Chris Evans. It's all right. It was a different time. Yeah. It was the 80s. <laughs> I love all of them, so we're going to let it slide. We're going to let it slide. <laughs> I look, this was not supposed to be real, people. This is a movie. So I was fine with that. And people are looking younger and younger lately, so we've got to get used to this. Yeah, they took advantage of that both ways. Amy looked pretty put together, but Tate, they're like, yeah, go full gray. That's helpful. And then Chris, they're like, Chris, we're going to really have you on point. You're going to look young in this. So it was fine. It worked out fine, I thought. Uh, that's all I got for Ghosted. I am sold, though. I'm in. I need to watch it immediately. You are already... I'm going to go home and watch it tonight. Yeah, you're not oh, going to do wow. that. But uh, I... Well, I might watch it on the treadmill in the morning, but yeah. Exactly. So... Yeah, you're just you're in trouble yourself because you should have already watched this basically or forced Eric to watch this. Yeah. And but now you waited and now it's our fault. So yeah, well. not fair. <laughs> uh okay. So the other thing I did see in theaters, which is still available in your, you know, local art house or whatever, somewhere in Queens, the Ray Romano movie. Oh yes, the Ray Romano movie. Okay. Yeah, so he wrote it and directed it. Uh, you know, he had a co writer. Um it you know, it's interesting. I mean, there's definitely some interesting aspects to it because part of this whole thing is about his son. He's only his one child who's about to graduate high school. And, you know, what's going on with that and playing sports and how this is affecting his life. And, you know, also where Ray is at in his life because he's in the family business, but not exactly number one. So there are some mismatches in that timeline, which whatever. Again, it's a Hollywood movie. It was mostly fine when you're watching it. Laurie Metcalf is his wife. She's fantastic as always. Solid as always, probably. Oh, yeah. And I mean, it's very, it's very good. It's pretty, I mean, is it one long episode of Everybody Loves Raymond? Maybe. <laughs> um, but it's With real... higher stakes, probably. Yes. Okay. I mean, but still, you know, Ray is a little bumbly and that's part of the problem. And how is that going with the family? And But there are serious issues. And oh, how are we working it out? But then sometimes it's bad, but then it's okay. Mm. So whatever. That works out well, I think. That's a good pitch. Sold. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs> um, it was very solid. I mean, it felt incredibly grounded in that. I mean, this is what he always does. It's very family, this Queens, Italian, you know, it all felt very real. And I mean, yeah, the dad was incredible. I looked him up, Tony Lobianco. It's like, oh, you've been in everything? Well, I don't remember that, but you are great. Mm-hmm. And then the two, uh, they were teenagers, and sometimes they were irritating, but they were, it was very <laughs> realistic, and it, they never used it as a device to drive you insane. It was like, no, this is kind of what would be happening in this scenario, which sometimes was a little bit much. One of the scenarios is a little forced, but it was like, well, if we're going that way, that's kind of what's going to happen. Mm. So I thought it was very enjoyable. I do hope, you know, a lot of people see it. I haven't read anything about like what Ray is like, oh, well, this is from my life or whatever, which I don't think is true in any way except for the family aspect. But I do wonder like, okay, yeah, where did this come from or why did you, you know, do this? But quite a, a nice story from Ray. And straight to the movie theaters. 
You know, it could have been so easy on a streaming platform, which it probably will go to at some point, but it's kind of nice it was in the movie theater. Yeah, although don't be confused. It says it's a 2022 movie because it was in a film festival in 2022. But then it didn't come out till now. So, you know, yeah, they they locked into theaters eventually. Great. Ah, interesting. Okay, Liz, what's Uh, up with you? So, the first thing I am watching is on Paramount Plus. It's Fatal Attraction. Oh my, yeah, okay. So this is a reinterpretation, a revisiting of the original Fatal Attraction, which, you know, most of us saw possibly in the movie theaters or on cable at some point in our lives with an amazing cast. Michael Douglas and Glenn Close were the main Fatal Attraction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, it goes very wrong i mean if you've never seen fatal attraction i mean it did come out i i feel like i'm not spoiling anything it came out in 1987 okay hence the tale <laughs> fatal attraction there is fatality involved this is now set in current time mm-hmm. but it's the same character so dan gallagher and the character alex meet each other in sort of the legal world because he is a lawyer and she in this unlike alex in the movie she seems to be a victim's advocate and working for uh, the okay. DA's office. I will say this. The first one, the chemistry, the sexuality directed by Adrian Lynn, just the way it was shot, was so great. I mean, it, it's an iconic movie for so many reasons. Mm-hmm. And part of it is because of Glenn Close giving such a, a I don't want to say realistic, but such a terrifying portrayal of an unraveling woman. Mm-hmm. I won't be ignored, Dan! Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. Sorry, but I still, my friend still, when I reenacted that whole scene with Madam Butterfly with light flashing on and off, <laughs> and we were on vacation together, we still talk <laughs> about it. I mean, she was so fantastic in it that it is a little hard to go, okay, how is the current cast, which Alex is played by Lizzie Kaplan, which some of you may know from Masters of Sex and Party Down, and Joshua Jackson, who, you know, has been around for a long, long time. You know, Dawson's Creek. Sure. Fringe and, you know, other shows. The Affair, which I watched all of it, and Dr. Death. And the wife's character is played by Amanda Peet. So Joshua Jackson, Dan, and his wife, Amanda Peet, seem to be in a very loving relationship. Now, the only bummer is, in the movie, Ellen, that's played by a very small child, like eight or nine years old, they've made her it's more modern like they because it's flashbacks you kind of catch up with them after the tragedy or the incident and now you're flashing back between the memories and current because uh, dan went to jail and oh. i'm not spoiling anything because pretty much episode one scene one you know that but in the movie that's not what happens it's pretty much self-defense and you know in the movie theater people cheered ironically when glenn close's character got killed so we don't really know what happened yet in this version of fail attraction because uh, that this is too much of a spoiler alert sorry because we're gonna have to watch i'm not gonna say so i want to say is this considered a limited series or is it going to be multiple seasons i think it's gonna be a limited series uh that's just my take because i think there's gonna have to be a wrap-up to it right i want to say at this point the chemistry compared to the movie is not there Mm. Um, and there was just something away, you know, the, the, like I said, the lighting, the costuming, the smudged eyeliner on Glenn Close. I mean, the whole thing was freaking crazy with her crazy blonde hair. Lizzie Kaplan, I don't know who did the hair in this whole season. It's everybody's hair looks like, I'm like, is it New York? And, and is it like, you know, humid out? I mean, no, you're in LA, like you're in downtown LA court area. Okay. I mean, it is a little challenging to get swept up in their sexuality which that is supposed to basically drive them to fail attraction right right you're like oh really okay so <laughs> i mean i all in regardless just because of the original but do i think it falls a bit short yeah i mean i i, I don't think it lives up anywhere close to the original they obviously are re-examining parts of it because through modern lens 
you're like, okay, did Alex get a bit of a shaft in the first one? You know, yeah, and it sounds like they're doing a format shifteroo. With yes, this back and forth, exactly. Yeah. And mm-hmm. like I said, there's sort of a twist in it that I really don't want to give away because it will give away too much. So yeah, don't, don't, don't. It's on Paramount Plus. I do. If you've seen the first one, you don't need to see the first one to see this. But if you saw the original movie, don't yeah. compare it. Like I, I compared it a bit or had expectations based on because I think about in the last six months or so, I definitely got dropped in watching where all of a sudden I was like, oh, yeah, this. Oh, my God. They're about to be in the elevator. Oh, my God. I'm watching for the next. I've finished the whole movie. <laughs> so I think I'd seen it too recently to be like, damn, this was so well done. The movie. So in comparison you actually shouldn't compare it. So it's almost like a standalone. So um, Fatal Attraction on Paramount+. Plus. Then on a real twist on Netflix, I don't even know why, you know, I don't know if Netflix is listening to me. I don't know how this, I mean, like, <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a gambler. I certainly don't know anything about Pokemon cards or baseball cards, but there is a show on Netflix, King of Collectibles, the Golden Effect. Oh. So there's this guy in New Jersey, Ken Golden, who has a collectible business, and most of his money has been made in sports memorabilia trading. And of course, it made me think of our brother's baseball cards. Oh, sure. James I mean, where are cards, those? Yeah. There could be literally millions in there. Uh, John's making a face. Are they all gone? Uh, I mean, you are part of the chief suspect, so I don't know why you're Which bringing it up. Which I literally brought this up to Mark because I said, do you realize there's some theory out there that I like went in and sold baseball cards of James's out of some... What? I go, I... It's not that you sold them. It's you just threw them away. Oh, no. Nothing. Those... Because I think there was some big lecture that James gave us when he left for college. Like, do not touch these. I didn't have the gut. I didn't know what they were. I didn't have the guts. I didn't have the interest. Are you kidding me? Uh, okay. I, I, I don't know if we're bringing this into reality or why yes. we're even doing this. But it's not about you as a child. It's like the earthquake. Like, oh, oh this but, box, uh, goodbye. I didn't really help clean out after the earthquake. So I don't think that was me either in that regard. So anyways. Yeah, no, no. You're definitely cleared. Thank not you. At all. Oh, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Hand to a Bible on, uh, so, you know, I don't want to say whose life, but someone's life. I had nothing to do with it. But it really shows the world of sports memorabilia, including baseball cards, that have gotten completely out of control in the trading, um, really because, you know what, online. Online social media oh, has sure. blown it up. So you're not having to go to your little local card or baseball fan memorabilia store to deal with one guy one-on-one. You now can deal with the entire world trying to trade and put value on these cards. And I guess one of the big things is the unboxing, unpacking a box of cards. And oh, seeing sure. if in this random box of cards that you may have bought anywhere from $50 up to $300 thousand plus dollars that you three hundred thousand there is an episode so i mark is like why did you come to bed so late it's only six episodes <laughs> but i watched every single one there is an episode with logan paul who some of you may know from youtube world and he's considered very controversial and now he's got into boxing or the wwe he's a huge pokemon fan like huge really so you buy these pokemon boxes they come in like mini suitcases I guess each one that he has is valued at something like $336,000, right? What the what? Okay. So he will unseal it online and he opened up one for fans and then him and Ken Golden, because it's almost like a gambling addiction, decide let's do one more case because each case you open up like this, you up the odds that the cases that still exist that are sealed hold the like infamous card that is worth 700,000 or 1.3 million. What on earth? I I know. know, They're looking for the golden snitch. That's Harry Potter, but you know. It's close. (laughs) It's that level. And so then the other cases that still exist that are sealed like a golden ticket, you know, um, Willy Wonka, it's up to the value of that. So through the first couple episodes, there is a card, a baseball card that is everybody is looking for it because it was a one of one. It was specially designed, but it's just thrown in one of these packs somewhere. But, you know, the packs that were issued this particular year and through this company and so on and so forth. And it's a card about LeBron James and the value of it 
is supposed to be like almost two million dollars if you get it. What? It's it was so fascinating to watch, and then at times really heartwarming because there's a story about a young boy that's Italian bought a pack for like fifty bucks, and there was a card in there, Lewis Hamilton, race car driver. So it's not even just baseball or basketball because I think most of my knowledge of this was all related to baseball cards, right? Yeah. So mm-hmm. Pokemon, baseball, basketball, <laughs> Formula One, you're like. What? Soccer? I mean, it's crazy. So he finds this card that ends up being worth like a million plus dollars. How it's going to change even... his entire yeah, wow. family's life. And the one thing that's cool about Ken Golden and his crew of guys, they're so knowledgeable. It's really an education the way they put the show together. It's produced by one of my, you know, my favorites, John. I'm not getting into my whole theory about it. But the two football brothers... You don't know where I'm going with this? Come on, you know. I did uh, in just the moment of looking this up. Was it a Manning brother? A Manning, Peyton Manning. So he's a producer on it because he loves collectibles, obviously, mostly in the football world. Mm. But jerseys sell for so much, shoes, balls. I mean, it was a fascinating dive into this world that you know I knew very little about. Only memories are of our brother collecting baseball cards and having friends come over and trade them. And then I think even our cousin's husband may even had a shop like this back east. So it just one of those things where I was like, what? I mean, he did something like in business, like four billion in business because he will take the cards or the memorabilia and it's basically commission based. You co-sign on. uh, He doesn't usually buy the memorabilia. He co-signs it and does a very high end online bidding more for it oh wow so it just it was just fascinating to watch and i mean you go wow there's this whole world out there like i know nothing about there was one guy who had a collection of like the first apple computer and how much those are worth it's crazy oh wow yeah and just why people get fascinated about things like that and how they collect and you know there was no hoarder element which was sort of like a relief it was like no these are just very passionate collectors and then ken golden himself is such an aficionado especially about sports memorabilia and he doesn't really know about Pokemon. So he has some younger experts that are brought in. And his daughter actually is a pretty good character. And she comes in because she doesn't really know if she wants to be in the family business. But, you know, she helps out in a kind of a unique way. And there's good guest stars. There's a couple of good guest stars as well. So, yeah, very unexpected. I don't know how I got sucked into all six episodes. But <laughs> it is actually very entertaining. And that is King of Collectibles, The Golden Touch on Netflix. Wow, cool. All right, well, I think we could wrap it up. All right, so Liz, you just did your King of Collectibles, The Golden Touch on Netflix. What was your other one? (gasps) Fail Attraction on Paramount Plus. Right. Okay. And then I did The Diplomat on Netflix. Also, Unstable on Netflix, and then Somebody Somewhere, which has just started season two on HBO. And I did Quasi on Hulu. (laughs) <laughs> right. As well as I caught up on The Book of Boba Fett and Obi-Wan Kenobi on Disney Plus. And I saw Ghosted on Apple TV Plus and Somewhere in Queens in the theaters. All right. Awesome. That's it for this episode of What We're Watching. You can follow us on all of our social media at Podcast Watching. And thanks for listening to What, what We're, We're Watching. Watching.